Reinvention in the round with Lemon Squeezy, a unique coaching experience. Learn about the reinvention process and watch it unfold before your eyes. Business strategist and leadership expert Sherry Goodwin coaches ex-racehorse Lemon Squeezy toward new career options in front of a live audience. Welcome everybody to Reinvention in the Round. So excited to see all of you and thank you for joining us today. One of the things I, I always say is, you know, where you spend your, your time and energy are really the most important thing. So I honor those of you who have chosen to spend your time and energy here today with me and Lemon Squeezy and, and all of us together. So thank you for that. And this weather is amazing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, for those of us who have been here every time in what, eight degrees in February or whatever it was, freezing. And, to be here now is, is uh, just awesome. So, um, so today, we're gonna talk about a few different things. I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of the reinvention process and uh, a couple of new concepts that I'm adding on. We're kind of building as we go. So if you haven't had a chance to look at, if you've missed any of the sessions and you're interested, you can go back and look at the videotapes on YouTube from the session one and session two. And this will also be videotaped as well. Um, so, what we're gonna to do today is we'll go through that and then we're gonna talk about a little bit about more about the reinvention process. We're gonna look at energy and the importance of the dynamic of energy, what that looks like. I'll share a little bit with you about that before we bring in Lemon Squeezy and talk about what it takes to make an epic leap, all right? So we've all, some of us have taken epic leaps or we've experienced them or we see other people taking these epic leaps and we're like, I want that epic leap. When's it gonna happen for me? So we'll look at that and uh, see what Lemon Squeezy has to say about that. So before I jump into all that, I'll just uh, tell you I'm Sherry Goodwin. I'm a business strategist and a leadership coach and a speaker, and uh, I've been doing this for a while. One of my favorite things to do is to partner with horses for transformation, and I've been doing that since, uh, I guess, 2009. In fact, we have someone here who was uh, part of our very first class. <laughs> I was so excited. So it's all really fun to kind of uh, allow this whole process to evolve and shift and change and um, just follow that vibe wherever it feels like it needs to go. So let's start with this. Um, first thing I want to share with you guys today. So today we're going to be looking at reinvention from two different perspectives. We're going to look at reinventing yourself and so leading yourself through reinvention, and we're also gonna be simultaneously looking at leading others through the reinvention process by way of Lemon Squeezy. And Lemon Squeezy, for those of you who have not met Lemon Squeezy before, he's a seven-year-old ex-racehorse. Um, he came to me at the end of December of last year in a very bizarre way. Um, maybe it's bizarre, maybe not. I kind of believe in fate in some, some ways. And, um, <coughs> We've been together and we've been going through this process. He's, he raced, he had 24 starts as a racehorse and his last race was two years ago. He, out of 24 starts, he, won, he was first, second, or third 17 times. So his, uh, his trainer has described him as very competitive, which uh, I think is, is probably very true. I'm seeing more and more of that come out in his personality as we move forward. So what I want to share with you today is, is reinvention is really about repositioning, trying to figure out, for, for me, it's always about where can I add the most value or where can I add the most impact? You know, what kind of shifts do I need to make in order to set myself up to move to this next space? So there's three different areas. I've distilled what I see into three different areas for high impact leadership. And this is fuel, which is kind of your, your mindset, what you're fueling yourself with, your perspective, your even your physicality, how you're nurturing yourself, nourishing yourself, um, really, really important. And then the clarity of vision, where do you wanna go? And you may not know entirely where you wanna go, but what's that next step? Trying to be super clear on the vision. And then the third area is action, because without action, you don't go anywhere. So what I've found is there's this nexus point right in the intersection between all three of these components, right in the middle, where if you, if you get this all right and you get there, you can, you can make these epic leaps and you can get to wherever you wanna go a lot faster. I call that the high impact zone. 
So if a lot of folks are, are in either one, two, or three. So one is where you have pretty good fuel and you've got some clarity of vision about where you want to go and you're all jazzed up about it and you talk about it and you're, you're pondering it and you're in that space, but you never take any action. So there's that all talk, no action. I've worked with lots of companies in strategic planning and things, and that, that a lot of times that's where that shows up, is the plan just ends up on, on the shelf, and they just don't move forward with things. So that's one piece. The second one over here is fuel and action, and that's where you have fuel, and you're taking a ton of action, but you don't really have clarity of vision. And that can happen when you're, uh, you're just in the grind, you know, you just, you just just have to get stuff done and you've kind of lost sight of the bigger picture because the day to day is so all consuming. And what happens there is you start getting these scattered results and you start getting frustrated. And so I see a lot of this happening in companies that are in, they're fast growing, they're moving towards something and, and then they, they get in the spin of activity and they've somehow lost sight of the, the bigger picture, the longer goal or, and, their staff starts losing engagement with that vision because it's not clear. They're just in this grind and oftentimes you get attrition, people leave. So really important part. And then the third part is where you have, you have great grand vision and it's so amazing and you're taking a ton of action and you have probably for a long time, but you're not fueling yourself with the right kind of nutrients and thoughts and mindset and vacation or whatever it is, so you start to burn out. And so I have a lot of clients, some clients, who are in that space. They're already hugely successful, doing really well. This piece is really suffering. So we really need to make sure that all three of these are, are nurtured. And we're gonna explore this today. We're gonna focus mostly on this fuel part, and this is the energy. And Lemon Squeezy is gonna help us look at what it looks like energetically to move through a space, all right? And how you can make these shifts. The other piece that we're gonna look at is how important this energy piece, the fuel piece, is to the epic leap. So there's action involved. So you'll be seeing Lemon Squeezy and I go through this whole circle and you'll see sometimes maybe we'll, maybe we'll get there. I'm gonna detach from that outcome. It's gonna say, hold that lightly, right? We'll just see what, what happens. So this is, this is a chart to refer back to. Um, I love charts. My mother actually told me last time, Sherry, you have so many charts. I said, I know, but you know, I, there's a few things I like to clarify. So bear with me with a couple more. So keeping that in mind, we have this one, which you guys have probably seen, and I'm not gonna go into detail on this because we've talked about it in the past two sessions. Overview of the reinvention process. You're aware that something wants to shift. Then you have to make a decision. Okay, I've decided to make some, a new change. Then you have to actually make the change. Here's the action piece, right? that you saw on the other chart. And then you have to adapt and then you grow, but it's not linear. At any one of these points, you can get stopped, you can get in a spin of awareness and decision, never actually make the change, and that's where this goes back into the, the action piece. So it all starts to tie together. This is just important to know where you are in this process, because without the awareness, the awareness is the first part, it can help you get through the rest. Right? So we're always looking for that. So I'm gonna pull that down. And then finally, I wanna share this one. And we've seen this a couple of times. This is mostly just for reference. These are the states of transformation. So when you're thinking about your fuel source, which is this, which is what we're gonna be talking about a lot today, fuel, you're either fueled by trust, which is confidence and love and trust or fear from any moment to moment. And we go back and forth all the time with this. So if you're trusting and you're feeling really secure and confident, you're feeling safe, you feel safe to explore, you start to see open options and your world starts to open and then you get some growth. And again, not linear because on the opposite of this, at any moment you can be feeling all confident and safe and then, oh, I feel unsafe. How many of you guys had that happen, right? Walking along, feeling all great, and something, something. So what happens if you feel unsafe? All of a sudden, you stop. You may get stuck. You may get stuck in that place for a long time. You don't see any options. Your world starts closing in, and you shrink back. So you may see Lemon Squeezy see, do some of that today, too. This is the first day we've had the windows open. I don't know. May cause no issue. May be fine. May be, whoa, what's that? You know, I don't know. 
So we'll just see where that goes. So we spent a lot of time talking about this in the last two sessions as well. It's a really important chart, I think, because this is something you can use your entire life. You can be going to the grocery store feeling all fantastic, and then, oh my gosh, you see someone and you think, oh no, I don't want to talk to that person right now because for whatever reason, dot, 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 right? I don't have the right clothes on. I just had an altercation with the husband or they saw the kid, yeah, whatever. And you shrink and you run to the other aisle. This is what happens. So just a silly example kind of, but, um, but pretty true, pretty relevant for our life. And then finally today, what I want to share with you, and this is a handmade, because I felt compelled to make another chart. <laughs> I just couldn't hold back. So, so here's what the charts look like before I actually get them produced. Um, so awareness of the energy. So we're talking about your fuel source. I'm going to put this one up here. I'm flipping around a little bit here, but I'll be flexible. All right, so here's a fuel. Fuel involves your energy. And with your energy, you have awareness of self. What's the energy that I'm carrying from moment to moment? All right. What's the energy of other? Other, other, other. You know, whoever the other is, it could be somebody in your staff, it could be a teammate, it could be me. What's your awareness of other? Okay, she's excited about her charts. She's rushing through a little bit because she covered a lot of that last time and she's got really juicy material to go into. Whatever. And then environment. What's the energy of the environment? Right? So we had a great, thank you building. So the building kind of always is involved in the process on cue, and it did that last time. So if you were here last time, you guys know what I'm talking about. If you weren't, go watch the last part of the video. It's pretty cool, right at the end. It's really interesting. Where I got this from, and again, distilling things down to their simplest parts, is from being with horses. Horses are constantly, not so much on self, but they're always looking at other and environment. Self would be, do I feel safe? Now, do I feel safe often comes from these two other things. <laughs> other, is other feeling safe? Is the environment safe? Right? So that's what we're looking at here. Now here's a really interesting thing. Here's a perception that goes on. And this is where we're going to go pretty deep today. There's a perception about how you feel, how the other is feeling to you, how the environment is feeling to you. And it's usually one of three things. It, you're either threatened by it, it's a safe place, or it's invisible. Almost doesn't matter. Yeah. Are you talking at this moment specifically about your own perception? Yeah, it goes for all three, right? Self right. and other and environment. So yeah, thank you for the clarification. So let's start with self. So here I am. Am I a, a threat to you? Am I a safe place for you? Or am I invisible to you? I don't even come up on your radar, right? How many of you have worked with other people where you are a threat to them? Yeah, you are a threat to them. Now, the way you know that is awareness of other, right? Their behavior. Or you may just have, be mindful that you could be a threat if you have a hierarchical relationship and you're the boss and you come in and you're talking to somebody, you could be perceived as a threat. You could trigger that fight, flight, limbic brain, freeze kind of thing, unintentionally, but just because of your, your status in the company or whoever you are in your, in your career. Or are you the safe place? Or are you a non-entity, invisible? So what happens, I started really thinking, I think a lot about every single thing that happens in my life. I reflect every day, journal and all this. So I was thinking about this before I came up with this structure, because I always have to structure things so I can understand it better. Because I was in here with Lemon Squeezy one day and you know, he was freaking out about something. And I was completely invisible. I was invisible because he, was, he was, had awareness of the energy of other which were the birds were kind of freaking out because they were nesting and somebody got in a squabble, so they were squabble, squabble. There was wind in the environment, his buddies over there calling. 
didn't feel safe. So for me, I was completely invisible in that environment at that moment. Yeah, like that, little birds going out. And in that moment, he couldn't see me. So think about when you're at work, when you're at an organization, maybe you do some pro bono work, you know, you're giving your time, your energy, whatever, you don't feel appreciated, you don't feel seen, you don't feel heard. That's what that looks like. One possibility. Invisible can also be you're part of a collective. So you are not invisible um, collectively as a group, but individually you, you are not showing up. And that can be completely fine. So you can be visible as an individual, you can be inv invisible as an individual, you can be part of a group and be fine with that. So I'm not making a judgment about the visibility necessarily, unless it's not working on your behalf. Same thing with other. Is the other a threat? Is the other a safe place or is the other invisible? Does the other matter to you? So you can shift from one spot to another. You can be a threat and you can neutralize that and become safe. And you can also go back into the curtain and just become invisible. And there's times when that's important, when you need to recharge and refuel. You don't need to be out there all the time, being in the front all the time. You can actually give yourself grace and permission to go back. Yes? The problem with horses is when you're in the space and you become invisible, yeah. then your safety is at risk. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so what can happen if your safety, <laughs> the chart, if your safety is at, is at risk and you start to feel unsafe, how can you be a good leader? Because if you start to feel unsafe, you might get stuck, you might freeze, you might have your own little limbic experience going on, and that can be inc incredibly dangerous. So as, a, as someone who works with horses, and the same things for people too, if you're leading and all of a sudden you become invisible, it's the same thing. So I always want to keep this, this focus of this group and this work. I mean, it's kind of, by, there's a, a double focus. I mean, I'm obviously a passionate horse person, and we could talk horses straight up all day long, 24 hours a day. Believe me, I've done that with some people here. The other piece is the broader context about, okay, how does this, this metaphor of a horse, we're using a real horse, show up in the rest of your life? And what do you do about that? So if, you sh if all of a sudden you as a leader become invisible because you have an environmental threat, that happens, right? What do you need to do? What are your options in that moment? We need to answer it now, but we can, we'll, we'll see what happens with Lemon Squeezy and we'll talk about it after. But what do you need to do? What are your options when you've suddenly disappeared? <laughs> Yeah. Part of the reason I asked at the big, a minute ago about whether we were talking specifically at that moment about your perception is because it seems like most of your other charts, this, this thing is iterative. In other words, you're, you, have, you have a perception of the other's energy and, and that may include a perception that you're invisible and that therefore there is no energy coming to you from that other. Yeah. They're focused on everything else. And then your perception of their perception of you can cause you to change your energy, yes. which can then change their perception. So it, it kind of yeah. goes around and around and up and down these different yeah, levels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It um, totally does. And, and if they're a, and, and, and their reactions can, you know, you can get into one of these going on with this, this chart. You can absolutely get into one of these going on with this chart, and that's a beautiful observation, and I love it. And there's a lot of depth here. So, you know, boxing it out like this is, yeah, it's, it's not really the best way to present the dynamic or the intricacies of the dynamic that can happen, but it's a way to separate out, okay, hold on, how am I feeling here? What am I doing? Am I a threat? Am I, am I the safe place? What's my intention here? Is it coming across? I'm getting feedback from moment to moment from my staff, from my horse, from my whatever. Where can I shift? What do they need from me? And so there's a, a whole conversation non-verbally that you may see play out here. In fact, you have seen it played out, play out in the previous sessions. It plays out, this is not new. This is exactly what's happened a couple of other times. It's just... Today, we're going to see more of this and actually call this out specifically. 
And we may not see, I don't know, we'll, we'll have to be open to see what, what he brings today. I have no idea. I have, I have no idea. But, um, but at any moment, any one of these things can happen. So thinking about you know, how does it feel when you've suddenly disappeared and become invisible at work? How does that feel? Anybody want to share? Depends on the situation. Depends on the situation. So if I'm leading a group yeah. and, and my goal is to get them thinking, get them creative, get them moving on something, if I can lead them to the point where their momentum is such that they don't need me, it's awesome that I'm invisible. I can stand back and let them go, and that's Perfect. amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. You've, you've, Love you've, it. you've supplied the spark, and they've turned it into the fire, and they're going with it. Beautiful. On the other hand, if you're in a meeting, and there's a bunch of men, <laughs> and you say something, and they don't hear you, and your colleague, who is a man, says something, and they hear him, that's really annoying. So there's, it can be good, it can be bad, it just depends on the situation. On the situation, it depends on the situation. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. That's a, something pretty common I, I hear from a lot of my women clients, that exact scenario. Um, and not, not just women, um, but I, I do hear that a lot from women, and maybe it's that women express that more. Um, I don't know. You know. It happens more, because I have my colleague, my one colleague is very perceptive, and so he catches that. He hears me and puts it out there. Okay. And a couple times he's actually said, she said that five minutes ago. Oh, how nice. Yeah. And how does that make you feel when, when he... It makes me feel seen and heard. Seen I really and heard. So you went from invisible to visible. Yeah. By way of someone else. Right. <laughs> Fascinating. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Anybody else? Feeling thoughts on invisible? One thing that really struck me when you talked about the difference of being invisible as a person or invisible as a group, you know? And uh, I have a team and everyone works remotely. And so we have team meetings and things like that. We have web conferencing. But I've been struck, and this just happened over the last few weeks, having coffee with somebody on the team. And they've at the end of it, the, the meeting said, oh, you don't know how much I appreciate you doing this. This was so nice. And it just struck me how, yeah, we're a group, but they may not be feeling that individual attention. So I appreciate that. Oh, that's a great, great observation. Thank you for sharing that. It's so important. So when you have that group and you have unity of group, being able to recognize the individuals within that group and allowing the individual to be seen is really important. Really, really true. I, I was talking with someone the other day who was part of this um, really beautiful pro bono effort and a great project. They're doing amazing things. And they were acknowledged, and she's kind of leading the whole thing. And the group was acknowledged by another party in front of publicly, and it, that's lovely. But she told me privately that she felt silly even saying this to me, but she's like, you know, I just kind of feel like I just sometimes want to add a boy, just, just a private, I don't, need, I don't need a huge public thing, but just behind the scenes, you know, I, I really appreciate your contribution. And she said that, that's, you know, he, he called out the group and he said the thanks to this group is doing this amazing thing. And, it, and she's a senior leader, owns a company, you know, this person's totally confident and just raised that point. So I love what you're saying. So thank you for sharing that. So, so important to notice the individual contributions. And sometimes if you're running a huge company, that can be really hard. Um, but trying to figure out ways that you, you can do that and the ways that you can honor that unique contribution of time or energy or talent, whatever it might be. Yeah. Other thoughts on, on, on this for the moment before we bring down the squeezer? Bring him down. He's getting groomed up. So here's one of the, one of the, the risks. Maybe it's a threat. It's actually not a threat. Of doing this kind of work is so funny. So he rolled in gigantic poop this morning. <laughs> and he needed to go out because that's what they do in the morning. They, they eat and they go out. And if you're going to make them not go out and have to get them all pretty and stuff, that's just, you know, pick your battles. And so I, I opted for him to just go be a horse, go roll, go eat, go whatever. So he's probably getting his final touches of being beautiful this morning. Um, but yeah, so this is, this is something for me when I was working with him the other day and I became invisible. 
It, it was a very dangerous situation. And I've been, I have many horses that have been hot, unpredictable for years and years. And it's incredibly dangerous when you suddenly disappear as a rider or even in hand. I've been knocked over leading horses. So just because they spook and they, they do something. So trying to figure out, you know, first A, how can you move to a position of safety? Always being mindful of your own safety. And I never was like that when I, when I first started working with horses years and years and years ago. It was always about their safety and their well-being and to the detriment of my own. And at some point, that's a school of serious hard knocks and you get have to learn some new tools in order to make it more about my, my safety is actually more important than your safety in this moment. And so I'm going to do something like get off if I can, if I'm on, or do a different type of training and realize that there's a hole there in that, in that um, trust. So um, what do I need to do in order to shore up the trust, knowing that they're reactive animals and they're very close to that, that limbic system. So for, for me, it's about exposure giving them as much exposure as possible. And sometimes it's just, it just takes a ton of time. The same thing for people too. You know, it, it, if they're not that great at that, and this triggers them every time, there's something that starts to trigger them every time. You know, what are your options? Well, you take that work away and you, don't, you give it to somebody else and, and that's fine. That might be the perfect solution because that's where their strengths are. Or you might want to give them more training, more exposure, more, um, move closer into that as a leader and give them more support so that they have some guidance and some mentorship in that space. So a lot of different options there. So good. So Jim's gonna start bringing Squeezy down. He's coming down now. Looks like they stopped for a bit of grass. All right. So we'll see where he is. He's going to come in. And then what we'll do is work with, with Squeezy in the arena for a bit. We'll see where he is. We're going to check in on some of the projects we worked on last, mo last month, which was the poll project, the TARP proposal, and see where we are with that and anything new that's come up. And, uh, and then we'll regather here for a Q&A and more discussion. All right, so here he is. He's coming in. So for those of you who have seen him before, do you notice anything different? Yeah. yeah, actually this is a growing this is growing out. This is still the same trace clip from early. And this is my wonderful husband Jim. Thank you Jim for bringing him in. Hi buddy. What are you doing, buddy? Yeah. Oh. Yep. <laughs> so what do you notice about his energy right now? Calm. Calm. He's watchful though. Watchful, yeah. What are you guys doing in my space? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's filled out a little bit, yeah. Getting some good groceries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do that to horses out here. You can come here all skinny and they all end up looking like little warm woods. <laughs> Perfect. Great. So what I'm going to do is I'll take Squeezy from Jim and uh, I'm going to walk him around a little bit and then we're going to move over there. So you can either bring your chair or you can stand and, um, and we'll reconvene in the arena. Okay, let's see. Oh, okay. So if you guys can actually come over this way, that would be a little easier. Thank you. And Tim, if you don't mind the There goes the grooming job, Sherry. Oh, well. Sand angel. Sand angel. On the other side now. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so what do you guys make of this? He feels safe. He feels safe. Yep. 
He feels safe. Yeah, did he do that the last two times? No. No. The last two times, what did he do? For those of you who are here. He ran around. Right? So he feels safe, starting to explore, seeing some options. Has he seen me? Am I invisible or visible? Invisible. Invisible? I'm visible. Yeah, you're visible. Doesn't need me. Right. Ah, ah. So I'm visible. He knows I'm here, but he doesn't really need me right now. Now you go back to the first session we had. Hi, huh, buddy. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant to meet you. <laughs> and remember, he was sticking like glue. Yeah. Each time he's separating more and more. Each time he's separating more and more. Yeah, so if this was a staff person, what would your feedback be on the staff person's development? Good, good, yeah. Good? Yeah. Finding their own way, more independence. Right. Finding more their confidence. own way, more independence. Yep. How about awareness of environment? How does he feel in the environment? Safe. Yeah. Safe. Good. Well, you haven't thrown anything out yet. <laughs> True. Okay. And then what do you make of this? Comes back. Waiting for guidance. Waiting for guidance. <laughs> Get ready to work. Excellent. All right, so energy, so think about the, the fuel. What's the fuel right now? Anticipation. Anticipation. Is it... Um, Fear-based fuel, or is it confidence and trust? Confidence. confidence and trust. Okay. We have no vision, and we have no action. <laughs> this is what that looks like. We just, we're just, we just be. <laughs> okay. So we're going to check in on a couple of things. So my vision now is to check in on the poll project, see how things are going with that. Let's see about the poll project. All right, the heavy poll. So I'm asking him for an update on the poll project. How's the poll project going? Lemon squeezy. Going pretty good. You want to show me around the poll project? Yeah. How about this end? Remember we were, we had some issue with this end the last time. How is it? We all right with it? What do you guys think? How do you think the poll project is going? Really well. Poll project is on track. <laughs> I can just check that off my list. All right. So think about an employee that you just hired, or you hired three months ago. That's basically what this is, right? He's a partner. He's not an employee. He's a partner. But I hired him three months ago. I presented him three months ago with the poll. And I checked in on it last month, and he had, he gave me the runaround. Yeah. <laughs> he gave me the runaround. He was running and running and running. And today, a month later, we check in. Poll project is going pretty well. Poll project is not that big a deal. So for those of you who were here the first time, good. And so am I asking him to do any of this? No, I'm just walking. I haven't asked him. I haven't even told him anything. He's just telling me I'm good. Right? So there's no command that I'm giving him. This is about just allowing him to share with me, where are you on the poll project? Oh, he just tried to eat my <laughs> microphone. Don't do that. That would be bad. OK, that was a command. Don't do that. <laughs> All right, so a couple things. For those of you who came the first time, we had the, um, the ball, <laughs> right? OK, so we're checking on the ball. Now, I don't know how he's feeling with the ball. What do you think's going on with the ball? <laughs> Does he feel safe? Not 
What is the ball? Is it a threat? Is it a safe place or is it invisible? Threat. 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 <laughs> so that's what a threat can look like. What was his response? He's looking to you for safety. Looking to me for safety. So as his leader, I say, hey, wait, we talked about this a couple months ago. We might not have seen it. We might not have revisited it since then, but remember, it's okay. It was this part of the proposal. Okay? So I don't school this stuff with this horse. We don't drill, we don't school. I used to, when I did all kinds of other horse training, drill, repetition, school, school, all this kind of stuff. I don't do that with him. I present him with some possibilities. We explore or we shut down and then we move on. So this is all about him making peace with his environment. Because the training part, the tactical training stuff, He's smart, we can do that. Not worried about it. I may be eating those words in a couple months, but not worried about that. Okay, so how is, how is this ball now? What is it? Is it a threat, safe place, or is it invisible, or is it any, anything? Where is it on the radar? Yeah, I can see sticking to you. Yeah, it's like a threat. Am I good? Am I good if we bounce? Okay. So, looking pretty good. All right, so what if, just for fun, <coughs> we come over here and we say, all right, you know what? This is part two, it has a little twin. <laughs> awareness of energy, awareness of self. What do you get from him? So this would be awareness of other for you. Awareness of other, what's other? What's he feeling? He needs you to feel safe. He needs me to feel safe. Okay? What if we move it? But he's not running away. He's not running away. Remember the last time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He's there. <laughs> okay. So so this is, you know, we're, we've got a little, a little bit of a squeeze here, pardon the pun, a little bit of a squeeze for squeeze, and I'm just, so basically, is he doing this on his own? Okay, so you know, what are you guys noticing? Gain confidence. He's gaining confidence, right? But he's sticking to you like glue. Sticking to me like glue. Did you notice what happened over here, though, when I stood over here? Did you notice? He wouldn't go between him by himself. He wouldn't go between him by himself. Yeah. But what did he do? He went past it by himself. Beautiful noticing. So this is what we're looking for. We want to notice the little teeny tiny things. Not did he do it all the way, but did he make a try? A little teeny try. And I'll tell you what, that's what's missing. Yeah, got acknowledgement there. So that's what's missing a lot in companies. The people are not recognizing the try. It's an all or nothing. Did you do it or did you not do it? You didn't do it. Therefore, you're, you failed basically, right? So then whoever's judging you becomes a threat, and then you go into right brain, and you get all limbic, and you know, it takes you longer, because you're like, I didn't do it right, how am I gonna do it? And you, you come at it from a place of fear, instead of from a place of confidence and trust. And one of the things that I wanted to share with you today was talking about an epic leap. How do you make an epic leap? You can come at things and drill, 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 and flog yourself, and come at it from a place of fear, and I'm not good enough, and I have to do more, and I have to do more, Maybe there's another way. Maybe I can come at it from a place of peace and confidence and trust and open and allow and see what might come forward. We've never drilled two balls. Okay? So, okay. So how are we feeling about the, the twin balls here, this project? Is he able to take it on his own? 
Not yet. Right? No. Not yet. Is he able to take this on his own? Yeah. Yeah. So you guys can see the difference energetically. Right? He's like, got that. Old news. Check that off the box. No problem. So now we're going to check in on the TARP proposal. And the last time we checked in on the TARP proposal, or we introduced the TARP proposal, was brand new, and he watched the video from session two. <laughs> he wasn't really sure. So this time we're going to come back over here, see where this is, shake it out. What are you already noticing, those of you who are here? He's Different, not right? Running away. He's still with you. It's still with me. You're going to help me unroll it. I actually don't need that. Okay. So we're going to consider this proposal. So this is our this is our ten million dollar proposal. Well, it's a $10 million RFP that we are considering bidding on. And we, <laughs> I've got this. we were not sure if that's what we were going to do. Because remember last time, we thought we might have to outsource part of it. We were going to look into subcontractors. We were going to talk to Noble about bringing it. Noble was going to lead that part, right? OK? Remember, I don't school this. I don't drill this. I don't do any of that. Basically, what I'm doing is setting up an environment, hopefully creating a safe space, but not always. Because what I consider safe and what he considers safe is not always the same thing. And then allowing him to decide, well, where do I want to be? You know, how do I want to do this? <laughs> I think what most people, people who are not horse people do not understand how scary that tarp is to horses. I mean, yeah. I, I was on a horse, I was on my, my thoroughbred off the track, and, and, a, and a bag, like a shopping bag, blew by, and he reared, spun, you know, I mean, went crazy. I mean, tarps are not, tarps are scary things to horses because of how they feel, how they sound, how they look. And for him to gone from where he was last month to this month, he just and because you, you didn't even open it up last month, because that would have been. I had it thing. folded in a little square. Yeah. And he, you, you opened it up. He didn't get all crazy, and then he just like walked a post numb. So is that an epic leap? Yes. I think <gasps> yeah. <laughs> Huge. Good job, Squeezy. And and look, he's not even begging. He's like, yeah, ain't no big deal. I mean, so for, for me, this is shocking, really, and kind of not at the same time, because this is what's possible with a different fuel source and a different approach. And it's like, all right, so what? And let's see if we can even stop in the middle and hang out, not rush to get off. Because this has now become a safe place. It's transformed. This has transformed into something. That's crazy. You saw what happened last time I did my little shuffle. <laughs> He's going to shuffle, shuffle too. Yeah. Are you shuffling? He's shuffling. So this is what's possible. I got it. There you go. I got a reward. Hold on, hold on. I got to get off because I can't hear with all that scuffling around. Get off the mat already. <laughs> <laughs> I think another thing you can take away from both of these initiatives, you were really calm. You know, putting things down and folding that out. You know, it would have been different if you would have come into the arena and taken the edges of this and took it a little bit. Maybe you're not. But your approach helps him. Yeah, and thank you for saying that. And so, so the comment is that, that I was calm and that my approach, for those of you who might not have heard that, I was calm, my approach helped him gain confidence, basically. And if I had shaken it or if I had come out in a different way, it, it may have caused a different response. So last time we talked about calm, confident, and clear importance of leadership. 
no matter the situation, even if you're feeling, you know, being transparent and you can tell folks, you know, I feel pretty nervous about this. I've told him, so I started riding him. I ride him like once a week, which is not like training, you know, conventional training. 30, he's in a 30 day training program. You ride three times. <laughs> but really the whole point of it is we do this kind of stuff and not the same thing every day. I take him out of hand, graze him kind of near the cows as close as he'll get because he's bovine drama, still huge, working on that. That's definitely not a safe place yet. And the yet, right? So you talk about the growth mindset, I think it's Carol Dweck, she's written a lot of work, a lot of really great stuff on that. So we want to always have that growth mindset so we're always open to being able to explore the infinite possibilities that are really available to us at any time at any time. So back to the writing piece. So part of me, I told you, I've got this ex-racehorse. I used to work with racehorses all the time, but it was in my 20s and 30s. I'm in my 50s. <laughs> I've had broken femur. I've had surgeries. I've had shot collarbone. I've had a lot of physical wrecks and a lot of repercussions from that. So why do you get an ex-racehorse? Well, it's not my first choice for sure. But there's, there's something bigger here. There was a bigger purpose, which I knew immediately. And you can you know, go back and, and see some of that pretty emotional. Which I can get emotional now even talking about it. But it's, it's bigger than that. And so in, in the tack, so see, he moved, he moved into that. He moved into that. Do you guys see that? That's pretty sweet. It's really, really sweet. Oh, you're killing me, lemon squeezy. So I got this horse. I mean, he moved in because he could feel me going, no, no, it's okay. I'm here for you. Whew. Okay. So let me get to some, some, some statistics here. Um, so, so my growth edge is, can I feel safe on your back? Are you a threat? He's not a threat right here. We're good. Calm, cool, collected, good, confident, whole thing. On his back, that's a hugely vulnerable place for me to be. Hugely vulnerable place. So as his leader here, I do show up a little bit differently. Not tremendously, I've been working on it, on his back. Because I still have a little bit of a story about he's an ex-race horse, he's young, you had to da-da-da, you, you could get... You know, so there's a limbic, I have to be clear and authentic about that. It gets triggered a little bit, but it's manageable. I shouldn't say but, and it's manageable, because it's, it's both and. And my, um, so I've told him, I've told him. <laughs> I said, I told him when I write him, I'm a little bit nervous about this. And I know we can do this, and I know it can be amazing. I know it. But I'm going to feel a little, I might feel a little different up here than I do down here. And I'm just asking you to be with me and be okay with that and give me some grace in that space until I figure this out. And I had that conversation because I don't want to be, I don't want to pretend that, oh yeah, I'm fine. Because I'm not fine. You can't pretend to a horse. They read everything. And um, honestly, we're, we just rode around yesterday. I've already switched him into this little, um, beautiful little training snaffle that um, he couldn't wear in the beginning because we had no brakes and no turning and no nothing. And yesterday he's perfectly quiet off of seat and leg. And, you know, I'm able to, I can train a horse. That's, that's okay. But training a horse that's super reactive and flighty, which you don't see at all right now, <laughs> not at all, um, is a heightened risk. So, you know, I'm taking it slow, but he stands beautifully at the mounting block, and I can get up there and do that, and he can move right off my leg, and we can trot around and turn and stop, and, and he's quite delightful in this place, this space. Going outside, going in different places, that's all about now there's a new environment, so there's a new set of factors. Who am I in that space? Have I now suddenly become a threat because I have to, I'm holding too much fear? Or am I okay? I may be fine. Actually, a bigger space would probably be better because this is a little claustrophobic in here, especially for a horse that's used to running. So it's a, it's a process. But, um, you know, it becomes, the stuff really kind of becomes no big deal after a little while. And, and if you're willing, to let them choose. So he has a choice. He didn't have to do that. He could go over there and talk to you. He just realized he had a choice. He's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so comments, observations on, on this so far? Question. Yes, question. And if this is for a future session, then feel free to say so. Yep. But seeing how quickly he's becoming more comfortable and confident in certain, certain situations, I've 
in a leadership position where you know you make somebody comfortable and give them their space and they come up and they take they fill that space brilliantly sometimes that trajectory continues into overconfidence and um, yeah the you know, challenge of authority etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I'm wondering how do you when they kind of get to that place where that's just right how do you kind of keep them there <laughs> Yeah, that's such a great question, and that's something I, I faced with Noble, my horse Noble, who's incredibly demonstrative. Um, he was, uh, I raised him since he was a baby, so he's 15 now, <laughs> and um, he did. I created kind of a monster of confidence, and I got this, and then he became assertive, and then he became almost aggressive about it, and then uh, he was taking over, but at the core, he wasn't that confident. He wasn't really confident. He just was like, I got this more than you've got this. So somewhere I, I became lower on that rung. And, um, and it, it, took, it took me, I get behind the curve on that. <laughs> and so, so I had to kind of um, go back to some basics and be, get the respect back. It's all about respect. Yeah, it's all about respect, Lemon Squeezy. You're very cute with your little whiskers. That's very sweet. Um, but it, it is. But notice his feet aren't moving. He's not coming closer into my space. He's just here with, which is very nice. So it's about uh, respect. Setting, reclaiming the boundaries. Uh, what's important? What's their role? What's your role? And being really able to move into that and not get flattened by it. And it takes, it took a lot of work. So with him, he has a little bit of a different nature. I think what's going to be important with, with us as we go forward is continuing the challenge, the presentation of cool games and fun things so he doesn't get bored and then lose confidence in me and my ability to keep him engaged. Because with the engagement and the fun, then they're, they're in. They opt in. They're like, yeah, let's do it. This is fun. And then, oh, good boy. And he's very praise-oriented. Uh, you can see I give him a little treat here and there. I have never, ever treat trained a horse in my life before this, ever. You would never see me using a little treat in a session, ever. This horse was so reactive and so nervous and food-oriented, <laughs> thankfully. Sometimes they don't even see food when they're in that fight, flight, uh, prey drive kind of thing. Not prey drive, being prey, being chased. But he did, and I saw that and I thought, he sees that, that becomes visible to him, and I am going to use that for this horse for that reason. And if he becomes too pushy, then we'll, we'll have a different problem, but he's never been pushy. He's been really quite, quite respectful. Okay, so thank you, Lemon Squeezy. That was uh, quite lovely. And we're going to go ahead and um, we'll take a Q&A discussion over there and let Squeezy go back because there's no sense to drill. Um, I don't need anything more from him right now. And um, he did awesome. So thank you, Lemon Squeezy. So thoughts and comments on what you guys just saw. We were talking today about energy and we're talking about perception, and we're also talking about the epic leap and what it takes. So what does it take to, to take an epic leap? Trying. Trying. <laughs> Trying. Yeah. Trying. What else? What else does it take? I would go back to Nancy's comment about perception. And um, I don't know about anybody else, but I had this perception that that was not gonna happen today. I mean, mm -hmm. not at least the first time. Yeah. So how our perceptions can be, how it's important to be curious about our perceptions and not make assumptions and, and um, decisions necessarily based on those assumptions because we don't know what's gonna happen. We don't know how safe he's gonna feel. We don't know, we don't, there's so much we don't know. Yeah. So, you know, having perception be a, a place to start, not necessarily a place that we make concrete, huge decisions. Yeah. Basically. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. I, I know. You know, if I, if I assume that he's not going to be able to do that in that session, I've closed the door on that possibility. If I assume he will do it, what happens with that? You might push him too far and too might, fast. might push him too far and too fast. And then what happens if you push too far and too fast? Crash and burn. 
crash and burn. He learns not to fear. trust the big yeah. spirit. Learns not to trust. Can you recover from that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you can totally recover. Two steps back, though. Two steps back. Yeah. I was going to say what I noticed, and I didn't come to the first two, but he didn't seem to overthink it. He just sort of did it, <laughs> which I love that about this what epic transformation or whatever we're calling this huge. Yeah. It's like if you think about it too much, it seems way yo too big. Oh, I like that. Huge. And huge. if you just kind of yeah. do it. You just kind of do it. Yeah, I love that. Great point. And, and really, so not making such a big deal about stuff. Just, just give it a go. You know, what's the worst that can happen? It could be awful. You scare yourself. Okay. So scare yourself and then coming back, the resilience factor. You know, maybe it's two steps. Maybe, maybe it doesn't even have to be. Maybe it's, I mean, it's always been two, 10, 50 steps back for me. But perhaps <laughs> it's just a little adjustment and you go again and it's okay. It's like, oh, all right. I mean, look at these Olympic skiers, these guys that do the snowboarding things and stuff. You know, if they, they take these, they take these huge acrobatics and then they crash and burn on ice. Well, maybe they don't burn. <laughs> Bad. But they, they hit so hard. And then they get back up and they go again. They've got run three, we've got to qualify. It was just smashed. Oh, I'm going to go again. Woo, that's something else. Yeah. Can, can we talk for a second about the um, interaction between the safe place of other and the safe place of environment that's going on for him? Absolutely. In, there. in other words, you're the other. Yep. And then there's the environment, which might include the balls, the tarp, the pole, us, uh, et cetera. And it seems to me that you, you're clearly a safe place for him. And it, it feels to me as if that safe place uh, can expand to include part of the environment, Ooh, yeah. uh, depending on how you behave in the environment as the other. And so where some of the environment, like the ball um, or the tarp last time, can feel very threatening to him, once you, as the safe place, expand to encompass some of it, then he includes that as part of his safe place. Mm -hmm. But I think it's sort of a, it, right now, for my perception is that you're the core of the safe place, and it's just a question of sort of how much it encompasses at a given moment. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, if you take that into a work environment, if you have an employee who's the subject matter expert on something and there's a big review coming up with senior staff, you go with that employee to the meeting and yet have that employee give the presentation. The fact that you're there may give them more security in their presentation and in their interactions with senior staff than if you, for instance, just sent them to the meeting and didn't go yourself. Mm -hmm depending on what kind of manager you are and what the relationship is. Yeah, right. But I'm saying if yeah. you are the core of their safe place, yeah. then yeah, having you absolutely. there would be of value. And if you're a threat, then it might be better not to go. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And see, I think that's a good point about the environment. Because if you take someone into the executive conference room the day before and say, here's where they set the slides up. He always sits there. We sit here. You'll sit here. It gives you a chance to see that environment. Mm -hmm. So you don't have that on <coughs> everything else. It's beautiful. I love that. And I, I love what you're saying about expanding your, yourself as a safe place to encompass other things. So I've never used that. And that's really interesting about setting an intention of what well, I have actually with, with this arena. I usually come down in here and, and say, you know, I set the intention for this sacred space. It don't, doesn't need my intention, but. I connect with it and, and here it is. So everything in here becomes part of. I love the way that you've explained that as expanding from, from your own place of security and confidence outward and enveloping other, other things, other ob objects, people, could be places. So uh, now that you're saying that, I'm thinking uh, I, I've been I kind of compartmentalize the cows over there. I'm great with the cows. I love the cows, but I haven't I haven't expanded me into into their beautiful little cowdom, <laughs> so that lemon squeezy can then be part of that too. That's a great point. Thank you. And I love what you were talking about about allowing somebody to to feel safe 
and here by virtue of an extension of self, right? So I go into this room with you, and this is how it is, and it's no big deal. Getting back to your point about it being no big deal. That familiarity is great. So the thing is, one of the things that, that I work on with my horses is independent thought and people. Oh, I, I, that's what I'm after, independent thought. What do you think? I'm more curious about you guys, and you're great about sharing. You're so smart and learning a ton here, so thank you for that. So really thinking, giving them an opportunity to make decisions in the space. And a lot of horses, especially a horse like that horse who is a race horse, it's a hugely structured environment. This is how you do it. Well, I'm gonna ask you to make a move here and you better move and they better move because it could be dangerous if they don't move, you know? I mean, you could have a big wreck or whatever. So it's highly, highly structured from when they eat, how much they eat, all of that kind of stuff to an open setting here where I'm giving him freedom to choose <laughs> and to gain confidence and also be present for him. If he gets into trouble, I've told him a million times, you know, nobody, no cow has ever come in here and attacked a horse. I can almost promise you that that won't ever happen, but I can't, never, can't ever say never, you know. It could, there's a possibility it could happen someday. But it doesn't matter what I say, you know, it's about how he feels. So yeah. what I like is, is you have an intention, but you're allowing. There's not an expectation, there's, there's not an attachment to he's going to do this, he's not going to do this. You're simply, there's simply an allowing um, that, that gives the freedom to do or not do and, and know that that's okay. Yeah, right. And that's, that's really important because your expectation colors your energy and that's going to affect him in some way, whether he realizes it, whether you realize it. it it's when you have an agenda that can, that can cause problems. Yeah, absolutely. So he's not wrong. No. So that, this is the thing. The try, the try is never wrong. Whatever you try is never wrong. The only caveat, the only time he's wrong is when he's in my space. That's wrong. And I'm going to get big and do what I need to do to get him out of space. And that was happening a lot in the beginning when he was real reactive and flighty and I was invisible and he'd just crash right into me and he didn't know any of the things that I do with the fancy little rope, neat, 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 back up, get off. You know, he didn't, he didn't care about any of that. He's just not safe, he's gonna run me down. So in that environment, he, no, there's a boundary right there and you don't cross that. You hope, you know. <laughs> yeah. but, that, but that then allowed him to make the choice to I mean, it was an epic leap, but it was like just, it was flow. Flow, yeah. It was flow. It was just another thing. Yeah. I mean, we're it walking around in there. There was no effort. No effort. Yeah, and so there's a little bit of, what did you notice about the pattern? So we had the, the pole project we checked in. We brought a couple of balls in, and then we bring the tarp proposal back in. So what did you notice about the, it's kind of an additive, or what did you think about that? Any thoughts on that? No thoughts? It seemed like they built on one another. It seemed like they built? Once he had the confidence with the pole, everything else was kind of an extension in terms of, I think I can do this. Yeah. And it's, oh, yeah, I remember mm -hmm. this. Oh, yeah, I remember this. Yeah, yeah and it's, it, yeah. Yeah, I would just say it seemed, though, with the balls, he was, he wanted to be curious, but still wasn't quite sure. There was a difference yeah. in his energy and confidence then versus the other two. Yeah. And maybe going back to one of your other beautiful charts, there was, <laughs> he had enough fuel, he seemed well nourished and comfortable and taking a few actions, but not really any independent vision. Yeah, perfect. Great, so no independent vision on that one. He just didn't, wasn't quite there yet, didn't know, was, had some uncertainty about it um, and didn't, wasn't clear on what do I do with these things. Mm -hmm. You know, what am I supposed to do with this? There's, there's now there's two. <laughs> More of a foundation of trust and confidence than before, it seemed, for sure. Yeah, so there's a little bit of a building going on there with that. And um, for me, it, it was more about, oh, well, let's go see how this is. You know, let's just try this now. Because there there's a connection. And with the connection, that trust and connection, you can go far. So when you think about the trusting connection with yourself, you know, how much do you trust to go into to self? Trusting self, of course this is a reinvention program, so trusting self 
to be connected with your why, your purpose, your whatever it might be, to be able to just be in that flow and just, just go for it. Just try it without making a big deal about it. Just take the next little step. Just expand your safe place into, into this new place now. And then, ah, there it is. And knowing when it's enough, right? Knowing when, ah, that's enough. That's enough today. So with Lemon Squeezy and all my horses, they don't work there very hard. They don't work very hard, but they work really smart. And so they're, they like, because again, they don't need to be drilled. They need to be drilled. The, the drilling is important from a physical perspective. You know, you're building up endurance and muscling and all of that. That's, that's conditioning. Conditioning is different than, um, how would I say, learning. There's learning and then there's conditioning and the learning. And you can do both at the same time. But I'm not that worried about conditioning him right now for him to be round and over the back and on the bit and going like that. I don't care about that right now. I'm building the relationship and building the foundation so that when we start doing more of that, it'll make sense. And he'll be more willing to give it a go. And we'll Because it's a little hard. And ah, there we go. Ha, ah, that's it. That's enough. So how do you know when it's enough? Before it all... Before the wheels come off. Before the wheels come off. Yeah. I mean, seriously, that's something that some of us have to learn. You know, push, push, push. Oh, the wheels just came off. Yeah. yeah. When I end on a good note, I mean, be happy. Yeah. You know? Yeah, end on a good note, kind of accepting where that is. And that was good enough. So in a relationship with other, whether it's a staff person, and um, there might be some very prickly staff person that works for you or that is your boss or, <laughs> or a colleague, a work, you know, somebody in your world. And you're like, yeah, you know, okay. But I'm going to take this relationship and I'm just going to incrementally, uh, there's a great TED talk, marginal adjustments. This guy, Stephen, I'm forgetting his last name. Amazing. Talks about marginal adjustments. And, um, and what he's achieved with marginal adjustments. He's achieved all kinds of great things, just making small tweaks over time. So detaching from outcome, making the small tweak, and then coming back and being satisfied that that was enough. So the interesting thing, it's a mindset shift. It's really a mindset shift. I was just, like I said, I was riding Squeezy yesterday, and Jim was helping me. And Jim is amazing, and we have very different worldviews. We have the same values. We have very different worldviews, and he's a... Um, very, very savvy, precise, exact, you know, this is how it is, and go really deep. And I'm a little more generalist, you know, like, ah, oh, that's good, yeah, and I, I speak in vagaries sometimes, and he's like, what the heck, so we've been married over 20 years, so we've, we've had to work on it. <laughs> so I was on Squeezy yesterday, and one of the things that's really important in, in training a horse is to be able, especially a young horse, is to be able to... Um, disengage the hindquarters. And what that means is you're sitting up on them and that you ask them to move their hindquarters to the side because what happens is that's their power source. And when they yield their power source to you, you are their leader. You see them in the field doing that all the time, pushing each other around. And especially if they push the hindquarter, it's, and it's just a great technical thing to be able to do for a number of reasons. So I hadn't taught him how to do that, taught him how to stand at the mounting block right on. And, uh, and, and so the next thing, well, maybe walk him around, but I wanted to teach him that, just a little step. So I'm sitting on him, and I, I started to ask for it. He doesn't know what I'm asking. And the fact that these horses even can figure this stuff out is like shocking to me. Like you pull here, you put this thing here, and you go, and then they do something. Oh, good boy. What? If somebody did that to me, I wouldn't know what to do. But they figure it out. So I just, and he, he shifted his weight, and he just moved one leg over. And I stopped right away with my ask, because there it was. You know, he, he made such a huge effort, and I'm petting him. He's standing there. I'm, good boy. And I said, look at that. He just did a, you know, he just disengaged the hindquarters. And, and Jim says, no, he didn't. And I, I said, well, you know, really what we need to do is, is I need to be more clear and I need to come over there and, and, you know, be more clear. So he takes that full step over to the side. He's right. He's absolutely right. The horse didn't do a full disengagement of the hindquarter, but the horse tried to do it. He tried a little bit. He didn't panic. He didn't run from it. And he gave me a little something. It gave me the start. I think this is the time to mention the old Ray Hunt phrase, which is so <laughs> central to that whole horsemanship, which is you recognize the smallest change and the slightest try. There. That's it. Ray Hunt. Yes. Exactly. So that's either ingrained in your nature or you've been taught that 
or you still need to learn it. Mm -hmm. So repeat that again, please, for those of, of us who are taking Recognize notes. Recognize the smallest change and the slightest try. Yeah. Well, that's it. That's it. <laughs> well, I mean, I, you know, I'm I mean, that's quoting, true. obviously. I mean, but it does make it, it changes. If you begin to look at your interactions with other that way, it changes your worldview. Changes your worldview. It really, really, really does. And and being able to, to see that, you know, where is that happening? We had the same thing the other day. I had the horse up over here by the by the window, and the cows are yonder. They're in like two fields over, but they're close. And so for him, that's you know, first I couldn't even get him anywhere near there. The first month, you know, he was he'd come up by here, and you know, anytime we'd start going this way, he'd do, nope, you know. And we gradually got a little closer, a little closer, closer. So finally, now we were doing up there is in and this is both on his back and, and in hand. So I had him in hand the other day. I just was walking up there doing some stuff and, and now we stop and we look at the cows. Right? Stop and look at the cows. But he comes come statue horse. So there's a way of looking at the cows and there's ways of looking at the cows. Like this is like, oh my God. You know, if you're holding your breath and your, your eyes are like this, then okay, there's something there. And then there's like that. And then there's hanging with the cows. So there's all kind, and there's a whole bunch of permutations in, in between, variations in between. So you have to be able to read, you know, what, but my goal was, he's there. And, and Jim said, why, and I was stroking him with the little thing. He said, why are you rewarding that behavior? Because he stopped. And, and it's a valid question from a horse training perspective or from a whatever, he's supposed to walk by the window, right? And, and this is, I'm not criticizing my husband, I love him, he's amazing, and he's, he's right. And I'm using this as a point because this is what happens at work too. He didn't do that. Yeah, but what did he do? Well, maybe he didn't do anything, but <laughs> that's another story. But he might have done something to move that forward, but it was invisible to you, it was not on your radar. And so after about two minutes of just hanging there, the horse walked perfectly fine, both directions, down and down, and I got on him and I rode him around, he's fine. So that's what that horse needed on that day. Now, if I was taking a different horse who's going to use, or a different person who gets distracted and is using that to not do work, that's a different leadership challenge. So you as a leader need to be, re this may, be, it may present as similar looking behavior, but there's a different motivation, different intention behind it, that you have to be pretty savvy to be able to read. That's where we want to get curious and feel into our entire being and really try to understand what's happening there, awareness of other. So any, yeah, Jim. Um, so I had a martial arts school at yeah. one time. I had another life. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I taught to my people that taught for me is you have to remember when you teach a no belt how it felt to be a no belt. You have to be willing to allow them to fail, to learn from that. And for years I was at the top of my field, and now I'm erasing that and beginning all over again. In fact, my favorite thing right now is I'm learning to ride. I've had eight classes, <laughs> and I'm allowing myself to be that Nobel and that beginner. <coughs> and I think sometimes we work so hard to become leaders, we learn so hard to be on top of our field, and then we have all these employees, and we forget how it feels and how to motivate a beginner and allow not only them to fail, but know that even as a leader, sometimes your leadership's gonna fail, and it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's not the end of the world, but I think a lot of people forget how it is to be the new person in a, in a business or on a team or whatever, and they have to have confidence that it's okay to fail, step up, and keep going. Beautiful point. That beginner mindset. Um, as a horse, as I'm learning to ride horses, it's fun to just relax and let the instructor instruct. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm not teaching. But her trainer is my trainer. And, uh, you know, Cindy's doing all of her fancy stuff around me, and I'm like, up, down, up, down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, but I'm loving being at the beginning. And although I, I'm like, quarter of my eye, I'm, I'm that no belt looking at the black belt going, I'm going to do that. You know, I, I have to bring myself back and say, up, down, up, down, up, down. You yeah. know? And just enjoy being at the beginning again. Mm, I love that. Really I love that. Yeah. Even with Lemon Squeezy yesterday, it was a total up, down, up, down, up, down. I'm in my little, like, hunter jumper saddle and I have all dressage horses, those elegant, warm blood movers, you know, and they're amazing. And I had just ridden Noble, who's 
spectacular lately. And then I get on squeezy, I'm like, eh, 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 eh. <laughs> oh my God, my stirrups, I'm like, I better hike these up. My legs, I'm like, where am I here? And I'm like, good boy, you know, I'm going around like a little is pony ride. Is there anything ride. more than that in riding horses? <laughs> <laughs> this is where I am, you know, and I'm, I'm a beginner in this relationship and, and that's completely fine and I'm finding great humor in it and I'm really learning a lot, so it's been pretty fun. Somebody over here had a comment or observation. Um, I, yeah. You just kind of said what I was been coming to me. The first day for Lynn Squeezy, since Lynn Squeezy is our teacher, it was like he was walking into the first day of work. Mm -hmm. It's a new new environment, new people, new rules, new like and there's all those emotions that go with that. And then the next time, which was our last time, we saw the He's a little more comfortable in, hey, hey, I know how the system kind of works. Oh, wait, you're throwing something different at me. Uh, but, okay, this time was like, he was so grounded. He was, I keep getting home. It's like, he's home. Mm. He gets it. There's this beautiful connection. Synergy. It's, you know, and so that trust, but it's, you know, and then all the things that everybody's talked about, that energy expanding mm. to include the... It's like he's like, I was just what was happening. I'm like, I don't have. I'm sorry, I get emotional. I can't talk. Yeah. And the, I mean, it was this journey that you guys are doing, and you're letting us all be part of, and all of us are part of it, and relating to this in our own unique ways. It's like, I have no words, but what I see is like, oh my God, what's next? It's like, <laughs> with you up on. So what I got was, you know. You're down on the ground. You feel comfortable. He feels he's. We saw what we experienced, and it's like, okay, wow, that's very different from the last two times. But when you mentioned getting up, there's a shift in you yeah. a little bit. Yeah. There will be a shift in him feeling you doing yep. that. But if you can somehow hold that, what yeah. I get is if you can hold that, switch kind of switch roles because I was getting from him. I got. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trust he does me, got it. We're a team. Yeah. I feel this. It's like what the future holds. Yeah. Like, Aww, thank anyhow, you. For, and for you know to to be the employee or to be the leader. I don't know. It, it's it's just a, I don't know. Okay, last words. Yeah. Thanks, Janet. And I I know because there's so much there's so much feeling behind that, and you're absolutely spot on. And the words fail in in that feeling space. And you're absolutely right. I get that from him too. I get that when I'm when I'm on him, or even even thinking about that. He's been telling me <clears throat> for a month now. When are we going to go gallop in the fields? Yeah. He, wants he wants to. He wants to show me. That's exactly right. That's what I get from him. He wants to show me. Like I've shown him my greatness. He only knows a small part because <laughs> um, there's more. But he really wants to share his greatness. And that's, and he's like, let's do this. And I'm like, I can't wait for that day. Honestly, if I feel trusting and safe on any horse, I go for it, I'm good. He needs to give me a little bit more and the 80 degrees helps <laughs> for sure. But I need a little bit more foundational stuff in there and, and not to skip that and get too, too much like, ah, we're, because we're not quite there yet. We will be. And it's, there's a patience piece there that I think, um, comes from experience and pain and, um, and knowledge and wisdom, you know, and I, I, I need to be mindful of that and both make sure that we're both in a, in a good place without holding each other back. But I do get, he, he's, he loves to carry his people. He, he's very proud of his ability to carry a rider and he's adorable when he does it. He jogs around with his little, you know, his little spiky do and he just keeps a good little rhythm, you know, and, and, he's, and now he's turning and stopping and so it's, <laughs> it's really, really pretty fun. Anyway, I wanna thank you guys so much for being part of this journey once again. And um, yeah, so it's gonna just continue from here. The next session is June 2nd. May, I have a bunch of business travel and things, and um, which is really, really fun. Yeah, yeah, and, the, and a clinic, yep, lots of cool things. So I invite you to follow on Facebook, if you're on Facebook. Um, you're also on the email list, so we'll have a copy of the video up in a week or so, and feel free to share with other folks, because really my goal for this program is to share with as many po people as possible around the world through the video, which is why we're doing this, to get the kind of help they, they may need wherever they are, and it's free, so on the video anyway. So, um, so thank you guys, I hope you have a great day, and I uh, appreciate you, all of your contributions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.